Hello, uh, and welcome to our webinars on the power of OpenEHR. My name is Tomas Gornick. I'm the founder and CEO of Better, and I'm also the uh, board member of OpenEHR International. And I'm extremely happy today to host a good friend of mine, Rachel Dunscombe, who is the CEO of OpenEHR International. And we'll be discussing how OpenEHR helps uh, the healthcare system uh, with uh, specifically with uh, managing health data and getting ready for uh, the next steps in digitalization, which is an exciting field at the moment. So, hi, Rachel. How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm good. Great. Um, before we, we continue, let me just remind you that we will be taking questions afterwards. So uh, in the chat, please uh, share it with the team and uh, they will forward it to us so that we can answer them. Uh, in approximately 30 minutes. So let's begin. So let's start with a little bit of uh, what's going on in the world of digital health. Uh, Rachel, I know you just came back from Vive, which was uh, a big event in the US. What, what was your main takeaway from, from Vive? What are the challenges that uh, were exposed and uh, some of the answers to them? So it's very interesting. I think AI was on just about every stand, <laughs> you know, the word AI. But actually on the panels, I was on one of the panels about AI. There was a lot of reflection about, you know, what we need, including really good data. So data was a big theme in terms of AI and how we're going to get data ready for uh, AI. There was also some very interesting debate around data blocking and, you know, divisive behavior and being able to get data. Um, and it was really super interesting to meet with other policymakers and healthcare systems and vendors and, you know, actually talk about some of the challenges we've got. Because I think the view is that as we move into, you know, more intelligence and AI, we're going to have to really get those foundations of data solidly in place. So that was a really interesting set of debates and discussions. Great. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, the US market is a little bit different. I guess uh, business plays a lot larger role than in, in, in Europe, where a lot of the health systems are public. But um, we'll get to the US maybe uh, uh, later on in the, in the discussion, because, uh, like I said, it is a little bit different. But um, as, as uh, uh, we discussed before this call, there are some uh, things going on in the US, uh, which which are actually moving in the right direction as well. Yes, so, so um, what I'd like to touch on is um, the issues you mentioned, especially the availability of good data, and uh, of course also uh, new architectures which uh, which uh, are built differently. How do you see OpenEHR uh, solving these issues? What is special about OpenEHR which makes it uh, compelling for for the future? Well, I think the semantic harmonization of data um, allows you to join records together and create, you know, citizen centric architectures. And I think that's really something that people are realizing we need for the future. If you're going to risk stratify a patient, you need to be able to join data from multiple data sources. And I think that that is, you know, one of the really big selling points of open air uh, with traditional data sources you may have hundreds of data sources for one patient where you have to transpose the data and as we know it becomes lossy and difficult to do that so it's the most effective way of creating um, the unified record with the patient but also i think um, with healthcare systems at the moment being so pressured in terms of time and lack of you know clinical capability we need to rapidly make precision decisions about patients. We need to be able to know who we treat and what the most effective treatment is. And as we're able to pull data together from open air really, you know, easily uh, without the frictions of, of, you know, those disparate data silos, we can actually start addressing some of those, um, you know, issues we've got with precision treatments, the most effective treatments, but also um, allowing doctors, nurses, and other clinicians to be far more effective. So for me, it's also got you know um, a, a, a real difference to that bottom line of effectiveness and also the burnout of clinicians as well. Yeah, you touched on an important point, which is citizen facing. Now, you know we're used to uh, to having applications being built and bought by institutions, right? Where 
it's quite obvious that ideally they would be based around the patient. And uh, this is something which is not uh, immediately apparent, but when you try to think about it, especially in the context of a region or a country or a city, uh, it's, it's quite clear that uh, having data organized around the patient uh, makes, makes a lot of sense uh, for mm -hmm. care coordination, for better outcomes, for uh, population health. And I think, you know, obviously, and I'd like to hear your opinion, I, I think that Europe is leading the way in this, in this case, uh, specifically because uh, the public health system is basically a single payer model, which is uh, much easier to justify this type of an investment. But also um, we see this with private chains. Uh, we see this with uh, smaller entities like cities. Um, how do you see this from uh, maybe a, a, an NHS perspective? I know you've done a lot of work there. Uh, what, what's going on in that space and how can open EHR actually help? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think two things are happening. I think one thing is that social healthcare systems are realizing that, you know, the longitudinal record or the digital twin of an individual is the key to getting healthcare right, both for individuals and the population. Um, mm -hmm. I think also that we've got citizens who are starting to really want their data and want a, a unified experience with all of their data in as well. So we look at the NHS app in the UK and that's the start of that where the data is being pulled together. Um, and there's also that backdrop of the history that we've got. So, you know, as a recovering CIO, I would have had over a thousand systems and somebody's data would have been in potentially tens or hundreds of systems in my institution and on average in another five institutions in that city region. That just doesn't scale up as we get more and more data sources. We realize we have to converge to something that's standardized. And so, you know, as we look at European health data space and this concept of, you know, being able to take your record with you as you travel um, and other concepts like that, I, I think it's really becoming part of people's architectural view that we need um, the citizen centric record um, because it benefits everyone. It benefits social health care systems. It benefits the citizen as well. Yeah, and obviously to get to this place, what we need to start thinking about uh, in, and what's the main premise of open EHR is this separation of data and applications, right? I think uh, it's it's never more apparent than in this uh, patient or citizen-centric scenario where it's quite obvious that there's many applications and hopefully one consistent longitudinal record. Yes, the longitudinal record, you know, what you record today will be data that you can still use in you know, 50 or 100 years to risk stratify that individual. If they've got a chest health issue now, you know, it'll last through their lifetime. But the access layer will come and go. And what really open air is, is something that provides a platform for evergreen growth of healthcare. And what you can do is add, you know, utility as it comes, uh, you know, to the market and it becomes useful. So we'll be using gesture and voice driven and all sorts of things in the coming decades. But that data underneath it is still really valid and useful and additive. And so for me, part again, you know, my observation, having worked as a CIO is that systems weren't evergreen. They didn't separate that data and make it useful for the lifespan of the patient or the health system. What they tried to do is hard code the application to the data. And every time we got a new application, we threw the data away or tried to rescue bits of it and put a new data layer in that was different. And that is a, a huge friction and cost and overhead to health systems. With open air, it's far more cost effective because you build and become additive in terms of the access technologies that will go on top of it. And I don't know where we'll be in 50 years time, there'll be something we won't have thought of, but for sure it'll be recording data about people's observations and about, you know, um, all of the things that we record today, but it'll be using different technologies. And that's really what appeals to me with Open Air, that it is a platform um, that is additive. Yeah, and I do remember when we first met, uh, you were at a uh, CIO at, at a large trust in the UK. And I remember you telling me how you were able to switch the PAC system without touching the image, without migrating the images. And I think this is one of the early, uh, uh, well, one of the early uh, approaches to this, this problem using images, uh, which actually proved the point that in this case, you get a lot more innovation, you don't lock the customer in, you can switch the PACs without touching the image. And 
this is the easiest way I try to explain open EHR to people because everybody understands uh, the concept that drove uh, the, the PAX world to this separation of data and applications. Great. So um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in our Euro around Europe. And I'm specifically picking Europe because, as I said before, I do see that Europe is leading in this uh, in this space uh, a little bit because of the difference in the health system, a little bit because uh, basically we really do not have uh, extremely powerful vendors in in markets, which in most cases are trying to prevent change instead of facilitating it. So we see um, a very different health systems uh, in in Europe, uh, in, even in terms of how they buy uh, tech and IT, how they digitized. But um, the interesting thing for me is that it's the most advanced health systems which are adopting open EHR. And uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about that? I, I think that as health systems advance, they realize what the problems are with you know existing technologies. And as I said, having been a CIO myself, you you realize that data becomes you know fragmented, disparate, and you're unable to leverage it in the way that you should you know, be able to leverage it. I think certainly in the UK, we're seeing some really interesting conversations. We're seeing more and more people um, moving towards open air in, in different ways. Um, and certainly we're seeing senior people within the NHS talking architecturally about architectural patterns for open air and the advantages of that. So that for me, that's the conversation that it is sort of maturing but it's based on the evidence of experience. Um, and I think, you know, to a degree, um, some people uh, have had pain and are able to reflect on that and see why, you know, a, a proper architecture is needed for the future. So the UK, obviously we've got some really exciting things happening in Wales and Scotland that are worth mentioning where they're very much using open air for um, various different use, use cases. Um, and again, it's it's being done at a national level there as well, which is is really exciting. And also leveraging the likes of cloud technologies and other things which make this scalable, which I think is is uh, really good. So the UK for me is probably reflecting on some of the pain it's had from the, the history of buying so many things that are disparate. Um, I think in Spain, it's really interesting because um, obviously you've talked with Jordi and I, I know you've had a, a good conversation with him, but they've taken um, a very interesting approach. So they've taken a sort of semi-academic approach to looking at the target architecture they should use. So they've done a Delphi study. They've had academics from around um, the world joining them and actually reviewing that study and looking at the outcomes. And really, open air has been chosen as um, you know the data layer, if you like, for what they're doing in Catalonia. And it looks like that's going to be moving into other regions as well. And that's been quite a rigorous process. But instead of a reflection on the pain, it's been a reflection on what a, a suitable target architecture should be, which is um, really good. And it's been nice to be part of that academic process as well with Jordi. I think we're seeing in Switzerland um, some really interesting uh, activity in the university hospitals. So the university hospitals there, um, a number of them are testing the market at the moment, and they're actually wanting um, open architectures with open air. And I think they probably have learned from other people's experience as opposed to, you know, learning the experience themselves. But there's quite a community actually in Switzerland who are joining together and making an affiliate around open air. And so it's very nice to see that activity and see the curiosity about the journey that other countries have, have taken. Obviously, in the Nordics, we've got a long tradition of open air, which is growing with, you know, lots of vendors. Um, but I think within Sweden, it's really interesting to see the seven regions uh, who are RGFI. And of also, obviously, we've got Karolinska, who, um, you know, have gone to framework. So those are, you know, a set of different approaches. So, you know, the Nordics being really well steeped in this. But the other regions all taking their own journey towards finding open air is, is for them. But I believe you have also got some news around Greece as well, Thomas. Yes, uh, uh, last week uh, our partner just signed the national um, shared care record for Greece, which is going to be based on open EHR for the entire country, which is which is exciting. And uh, you know what 
what I'm seeing is uh, something that you mentioned before, you know, that uh, the most advanced countries adopting OpenEHR is probably because they have tried a lot of things. You know, you can imagine, and I know from experience that the Nordics, uh, if I'm talking about uh, uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, and Finland, have been collecting uh, really good data for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But what they've seen is that uh, they didn't use many standards. Uh, sometimes they invented uh, their own formats uh, or used some proprietary technology, and this has cost them. So in the next iteration, and that's why I think they are most advanced because they're already working on the next uh, next uh, iteration, they want to uh, to solve that issue, and uh, that's why they came to OpenEHR. Uh, if if I uh, think about the NHS, for instance, uh, you know that there was a big national program which tried to uh, build shared care records called the LICRAS across the NHS, and they actually succeeded in putting the data together, unfortunately, in a view-only mode. So where I see uh, the NHS now advancing is in what I call shared care records 2.0, where they actually use the data to... to applications, coordinate care, but in this case, it has to be bi-directional. And this is where I think, again, OpenEHR provides uh, the capabilities to build applications on top to enable these use cases. So um, again, uh, you need to have the first uh, version, which, which puts the data together. So I think those countries that have done that, you mentioned Catalonia, of course, that's mm -hmm. uh, probably the flagship at the moment because they do a lot of things uh, centrally and they have a very good and, and large team thinking about uh, very far into the future how they will use data in all kinds of ways, including secondary use. And they're able to do this at the regional level. So mm -hmm. this is a huge step forward. Um, in my home country, obviously, in Slovenia, uh, we've been yeah, using OpenEHR for, I guess, uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, and now we're going into the next step, which is care coordination and and all of this. So I think there is a process there. It's it's hard to jump uh, uh, jump a few steps, even though, come to think of it, uh, some of the countries like Ireland is trying to do that uh, at the moment. Learn from others and uh, jump over maybe a step which might not be necessary at this moment. Um, okay, so you mentioned uh, the uh, the inroads of OpenEHR in in the um, NHS. Uh, you mentioned uh, the the RFIs in in Sweden, uh, and of course, I, I want to come back to to Karolinska because yes. uh, I think the amazing thing there is that this new approach is kind of clinician led. I would say absolutely yes, yes. Uh, you you all know who I'm you know who I'm talking about, right? But the way that the CCIO of Karolinska explained mm -hmm. it explains it makes a lot of sense uh, and he's great speaking to clinical leaders and uh, mm -hmm. and basically talking about the uh, the clinical benefits of this approach but all of them share in common what all of them share in common is is that there is a big need for uh, a new approach and uh, yes. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the landscape of, of EHR software in Europe and uh, you mm -hmm. know there's a lot of issues. I, I regularly talk to uh, CIOs who tell me, I actually don't know what I can buy. You know, what 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 do I do with? I have an old system. I need to replace it. What can I do? So, what can you? What have you heard about uh, some approaches people are taking, or what's your advice? So, I think it's really interesting because it is quite a fragmented market in Europe, um, and there are a number of you know EMR vendors there but there's always trade-offs with whatever EMR you buy. And, you know, that trade-off may be, it's quite a simple EMR, it doesn't do everything, or, you know, it, it to a degree locks your data in or whatever else. So it's, it's really difficult. I'd say, you know, as a CIO, I don't think there's necessarily any perfect choice in the EMR market. If you are a CIO with an EMR, I do not regret what I did, which was to use, you know, sort of open data repository next to my EMR to make sure that all the things around the EMR did not grow out of control. Um, so I think there is a strategy for some people who've con contracted from EMR to, if you like, have your VNA for structured data next to your EMR. That's that's one strategy which I think really works and make sure that your data doesn't become out of control. 
I think for some smaller organizations, there's a real ability to, you know, be next generation now and, and do some interesting thinking about what you're going to do with your EMR and build on top of open data. There's increasing, you know, utility to, to build on top of open air and other standards, which I think, you know, we're going to see more and more people doing. And there is one thing that you said earlier, Tomash, about, you know, these sorts of journeys that the countries have been on. There's one thing that people who are coming to the conclusion of open EHR have got in common, and that is they've thought a lot about their data and what it means to them and how important it is, as, you know, the sort of infrastructure of the future. And I think um, whatever you do in whatever situation you're in, you really need to be taking your data very seriously because the data is an asset that will be with you for decades as opposed to any one system which will, you know, be superseded by something else. And I think, um, you know, you, you talked about Karolinska and obviously though we see that thinking having been done and we see people really looking at the clinical benefits of being the intelligent client, owning your data and leveraging it for patient benefit and organizational benefit. And I think whatever baseline you start with, you need to go on that thinking journey. I think the the worst thing that you can do probably as a, a CIO or a you know, CMIO is to just go out and buy something in the market because you've seen somebody else buy it. It's really important to um, take that journey and make sure you're being the intelligent client. Yeah, and you know, I'm always, uh, um, well, I can't say actually surprised because it's it's a common thing. But when I talk to CIOs of these uh, trusts, hospitals, a lot of times they tell me that uh, you know their roadmap is their vendor's load roadmap, which basically means that they are they're very locked in. So, I think where where it starts to change is uh, when you when you start to miss something and you need to actually go out to the market buy something and then struggle with the integration. Or if you have a unit that does innovation and uh, really, really has a hard time getting the data, basically your own data, out of a, of a current system. And this is something where I think uh, the advanced uh, uh, providers have started to think more and more about, yeah, let's uh, unlock the data and make it available for other uses, including other applications and then secondary use and so on and not be so dependent on the vendor. And what this does also is, is de-risks de your investment in that vendor because you're able to do uh, a migration uh, to another vendor much easier. It's not easy. None of this is easy. We know in healthcare, it's extremely complex, but at the same time, um, you will have to do it at some point, right? The whole idea of this separation is that the data will outlive the application in any case. So uh, that's not something you can avoid. And if you can start preparing for this, I think uh, the sooner, the sooner, the better. OK, so we've touched a number of points um, and I want to um, to uh, go to the next uh, uh, topic, which is you've been now with uh, OpenEHR as a CEO. Obviously, you've been involved for a longer time, but as a CEO for now six months, Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what's your experience? I mean, what what surprised you most about about the community, uh, about the uh, industry partners? Um, what's your thought? So it, it is probably the most passionate community in terms of wanting to do the right thing for healthcare that I've come across, which is absolutely fantastic. It feels very much like le working in learning health systems and other things for everyone is completely understanding why we need to do what we need to do. And, you know, it, it is pulling along. But I think the thing that's really surprised me is that we've got, you know, individual clinicians, we've got big corporates, we've got, you know, health systems, but everyone is working together collaboratively. And, you know, the ethos of this sort of co-creation of the future, um, it, just seeing that emotion has has been really really interesting and seeing how well all of those different parties work together um that has really surprised me because i've not seen anything like that before in healthcare it, it's a really fantastically collaborative community um i think what's also surprised me um really is um just how extensive the body of work has been that Open Air has put together over 20 years. Yeah, you know, I keep finding, you know, new things that have been done over the years that could be leveraged by health systems or by companies, whatever else. And um, 
there, there's just such a wealth of, of knowledge in the clinical modeling and the, the technology that's been built up. That's of huge use to so many different parties in healthcare, be it companies, you know, small companies that want to build something, large companies that want a new offer, be it health systems that want to own their own data. There's already a, a massive open source um, asset there that keeps surprising me in terms of what's, you know, what's been developed and, and you know, the extent of it as well. Yeah, you know, I agree. I think uh, this is what uh, I was surprised initially. I joined probably. 15 years ago and uh it was amazing even then uh, first of all i love the idea and and the, the the technology the architecture the approach but then the willingness of people to share uh, i think is one of the uh one of the most uh, uh important things uh, about opening a char you never have a feeling that people want to hide how they do things uh, and i guess it's partly to do with uh with the medical field itself where where best practices yes. are published but I think uh, it's it's much more than that because uh, everybody seems to understand that we will all get better uh, working together. And of course, some of these things are almost like you know a rare disease. Uh, it's 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 rare, so you need to find the exact person who works on something similar. Uh, but that's been really really a strong point of the community. And you did mention something else uh, which we didn't address in the beginning. What is OpenEHR? Uh, uh, I mean, who can it benefit most? Uh, you know, obviously we know uh, healthcare and uh, and the providers. Uh, we understand that it works also for people building applications, uh, and uh, and of course we touched on uh, regions, countries, uh, cities. But um, I know you're also talking to uh, people like uh, pharma, for instance. Mm -hmm. So how do you see uh, their value? Uh, where will they get um, where will they get uh, the value from this? That's interesting. So who will this benefit the most? I would say the citizen at the end of the day. <laughs> I think that's who it will benefit the most. But yeah, I, I've been doing work with pharma and life sciences. And actually, when you understand how rudimentary a lot of the infrastructures for clinical trials and everything else, they can immediately see the benefit here of using open air as part of their infrastructure and actually potentially sharing standards for um you know providing systems for uh clinical trials they also see the benefit of being able to do clinical trials globally as you said rare diseases or cancers you need you know patient groups across the globe and so actually we've we've had um life science companies we've had small life science companies as well who are doing you know very specialized trials say in, in stage four cancer um we've had research groups all engage and a number of them actually are going to come together and and form a life sciences affiliate because there's a real movement behind this but the lovely thing is that if we get the data right for direct care and for the citizen then you know it's the citizen's choice to participate in trials and it will be in a format that's standardized so I think they all see the bigger picture and see the win of us actually moving towards open air. Um, and in that sense, it's, you know, it, it's almost a second wave. The first wave has been the healthcare systems. The second wave has been, you know, life science companies realizing the benefit of using these uh, sort of open standards. Yeah. And you, you touched on, uh, uh, on, on standards, which, uh, which uh, obviously has a big impact on how healthcare uses and collects data and, of course, there are many standards. So we believe, uh, and I'm and I'm sure uh, uh, you would agree that OpenEHR is the best standard for persisting healthcare yes, data. But of course, absolutely. there's other standards, uh, uh, including HL7 Fire, including OMOP. Uh, so historically, I guess we can agree that OpenEHR was not, um, let's say, uh, the best at dealing with uh, with uh, or connecting to the other standards bodies. Uh, how is this changing? Because I know you're quite passionate about this. Well, it is changing. And again, as a practitioner CIO, I've used many of these standards together. You know, as you said, HL7, FHIR, um, SNOMED, you know, OMOP, LOINC. Um, all of these things need to fit together as part of a jigsaw. But OpenAir absolutely is the standard for persistence. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about why. And the reason that open air i think hit the ground 20 years ago so well and built on what it did was it was clinically led 
And these are clinical models being led by clinicians. So I think that that standard, you know, the standard has actually been grown from the right seeds, if you like. But the other standards absolutely work around it. So, you know, fire for the RESTful APIs, you know, the terminologies that we, we put in there, all of these things are needed to build a functional healthcare system. And we've very much been talking with, um, you know, HL7, been spending time talking about fire. We've done a, a nice piece of work um, with the Smart on Fire guys to create Smart on Open Air so that you can plug fire and open air data sources in together and surface in apps. Um, we've been doing some really good work with SNOMED um, and thanks to them, we're, we're raising OntoServe as a sort of test harness for our community. And so these dialogues are continuing to see where we can um, have bilateral agreements and where we can, you know, actually help health systems and vendors to create target architectures with multiple standards in to make it easier for people adopting, um, you know, the different standards. So from my perspective, that's been really good. And I think it's, again, come from practitioners who've used multiple standards coming into the community that we're realizing examples and, and reasons why we need to overlap. But naturally, I think any standards community starts understanding itself. But then as it grows and there are more practical examples, it has to understand all of the things it's sort of coterminous with and it needs to work with and then relationships follow. But I've got to say that the likes of HR7 have been very welcoming and we've, we've done some really good work with them. Yeah, and uh, maybe we can touch a little bit on how OpenEHR is organized, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because um, obviously, uh, I think even for the people on the call, it's important to understand how perhaps they could engage with, with OpenEHR mm -hmm. in different roles. So can you speak a little bit about the organization? Absolutely. So OpenAir is a membership organization. So it's, you know, members from individuals right the way through to, you know, big corporate members like EY, Microsoft, Douglas. And regardless of whether you're an individual member or a corporate member, you can participate in governance. So we have a main CIC board um, and that actually has members voted on again from that whole range of membership. But beneath that, we've got a number of sub boards that people can participate in as well. So we have uh, the clinical program board, which deals with all of the aspects of modeling and clinical knowledge. We've got the SEC that deals with, you know, all of the technicalities, so things like AQL and so on. We've got the education board where we, we certify educators uh, and work on the education and, and roles within Open Air. Then we've got the software board, um, which is just being formed at the moment. And we are just also starting an affiliate board because we've got 14 affiliates now around the globe. But for anyone who wants to become a member, um, you can actually join in that governance. And if you're an individual and want to become a member, it's 21 euros a year. And that allows you then to participate in boards, participate in the governance. You could be on expert groups that are associated with boards and actually participate in driving forward the standards and driving forward all of the infrastructure that is associated with that. Um, so I would really encourage anyone who wants to be part of Open Air and contribute to become part of the governance and, and you know, learn a little bit more about that. But really, this is a, a community of people who have stood forward to lead and are part of our membership. And I think that really is, is the value of this. It, it's people who are, you know, willing to be part of the future who have stood forward to lead. So our governance is the main board and those five sub boards that people can participate in. Yeah, and you mentioned affiliates, uh, which is probably a way of OpenEHR coming closer to the market and the needs. And uh, I know uh, we have, uh, you said 14, I think, right? Well, I was uh, on a call this morning about possible 15. So, yeah. and I know uh, we're going to open the uh, the Swiss one in, in a couple of yes. uh, months. Uh, I know there's one being prepared in Italy. So there's quite a lot of interest, Oman or, or Middle East. Uh, yes in all, all parts of the globe. And I think it's it's an excellent way for, for the Open EHR message to spread and also to get obviously support from, from uh, the, local, the local community. Um, okay, so just one, one last uh, question. So uh, as, as a CEO, as I'm sure you have uh, uh, main objectives, uh, what you want to achieve, uh, let's say in the next, in the next year. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the future looks like for OpenEHR as an organization? 
absolutely. So open air at the moment is basically scaling to meet the need of the market. So as we see the growth of open air and we see people, um, you know, engage further with it, we're growing our governance to make sure that we can keep pace with people's needs. And you mentioned affiliates earlier, and I think affiliates are absolutely key to part of that scaling because the aim of the affiliates really is to meet the local market needs. So, you know, to work in country with the government, with the vendors, with the, you know, the healthcare systems, and we are putting more infrastructure in place to support those affiliates to make sure that the, you know, is the local tuning um, to the market to allow them to actually serve the market needs. I think there's a number of other things that we're putting in place as well to make sure that we can, you know, um, help open air and, uh, you know, all of the, the different localities who are using it to grow. So we're doing um, work around education, as I said, we're preparing a lot more educators who can train people in open air and make sure that they, uh, you know, can meet a competency framework. So that's something that's been put in place um, just recently. We're also, um, you know, making sure that uh, we've got an increasing set of offers um, in terms of supporting the community. Um, in terms of, you know, education, in terms of um, sort of, you know, membership. So there's an enhanced membership offer that's being put forward as well. And we're also putting on an annual conference this year, which will be later in the year. We've not announced the date yet, but we're increasing the number of events where people can communicate and learn together. So overall, it's about scaling safely. So part of that behind the scenes is about, you know, governance, um, enhanced governance, making sure we've got everything that we need. But part of it is about the membership facing off and market facing off to make sure we're supporting people in growing the adoption of open air, be they a health system, a policy maker, or, you know, a, a business. Great, great. So as, as we wrap up, uh, we got uh, a question, which is one we, we didn't touch on, but we said we would, and I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's timely. So it says, uh, why doesn't the US get open EHR? So I, I would answer this by saying because of the form of its system. So it's all about payers and providers over there. And actually, um, traditionally within the US, hospitals have wanted to retain their business and grow their business and not allow it to go to another hospital. So it served their need to actually have systems that ring fence the data and don't allow it out. And so the form follows function of the US system. However, now within the US, and I was sat with a, a CEO of, of quite a big uh, digital health vendor last week in the US, we're seeing a, a change where they are becoming value-based plans. Um, so that they're, they're being incentivized to, um, you know, to put wellness and prevention into the, the plans. And I think we're actually seeing a change. It was the first time I've been in the US and I actually felt a sea change in the message where people are recognizing that data needs to be brought together because there is a change in how healthcare is being commissioned. Excellent. So there is still hope for us. I'm hopeful. For, I said last week, I'm hopeful. <laughs> get a lot better at, at sharing data, which will open the doors also for technologies like, yeah. like OpenHR. So I have another question. Uh, is what are the barriers to wider adoption of open standards such as open air across the NHS, particularly in England? Uh, is it money? Is it small? Is it politics or is it security? Um, is it money? I don't necessarily think it's money necessarily. Um, you know, having been somebody that's worked with Open Air, I don't think it is. Is it politics with a small P as opposed to big P? It could be politics with a big and a small P because actually if policymakers um we enforce certain standards within policy it may help to move it um i think the thing that has stopped it being adopted actually in the nhs really to date has been um that we've thought in short cycles so certainly for me as cio the finance director said buy this you know the cheapest thing not the thing that would create data for you know um the long term uh, you know life of the patient um i think we're seeing a mindset shift, however, in the NHS. Um, if you look at the new hospitals they're building, um, I, I think you're starting to see a parallel with people regarding data as being critical infrastructure 
along with the walls of the hospital because they recognise that the new models of care, which are sort of the elastic walls of the hospital, are an extension of that and are a major asset for the NHS. And so I don't think it's really been anybody's divisive behaviour, but I think um, to a degree it's been that learning I talked about earlier. And it's also been able to being able to see clearly that this data has a very huge value for both individuals and organisations in terms of enabling new models occur that actually reduce uh, the number of beds you need in hospitals. So I, I, I don't think it's been deliberate, but I, I think as people start you know, thinking about the health economics and talking about that, we'll see a different set of behaviours, which then will result hopefully in policy with a big P changing. And I guess also this uh, this uh, speaks to to the need for more education, right? And yes. uh, I know this is a favorite topic of yours uh, when you ran the uh, NHS Digital Academy, which, in my opinion, made the biggest single change to perception about or or knowledge about how to move forward with uh, change management, new architectures, uh, and uh, standards and things like this. So. Definitely, I've, I've seen a change. Um, a follow-up to that question, more a comment, is that the original vision for Lycras uh, was to facilitate uh, read-write uh, care planning uh, uh, through this, uh, this type of integration. And, you know, um, you know, we have this project in, in London called One yes, London. London. We were able to augment the, the shared care record with such an approach of care coordination. And I do think that that is the future, absolutely. I so agree. there is um, one more question, which is uh, there is a misconception that OpenEHR does not have models for all clinical encounters. How would you address that concern? So uh, the way that I'd address that concern is um, <laughs> that it's the most extensive set of clinical models on the globe, first of all, and it's additive and you can have local teams that will add to it. So having talked to many healthcare systems about this, as a minimum, every healthcare system I've talked to has found 85% plus of the clinical models they need there. And having gone through the clinical models myself, I think, you know, if you're gonna get 85% plus of the clinical models you need, um, you will you will then be able to build on those if you're doing something novel or new or you know extending it um so for me uh i, I think i'd probably address that concern by saying if not in open air then were <laughs> because there yeah, are no also, you, you mentioned that it's uh, it's actually growing really fast uh, yes. we now have we now have actually uh i think over three thousand users on the modeling tool which is web based really? so we can actually count that which is amazing so that many people modeling will definitely uh, make sure that uh, the models will be there uh, much more than in any other approach. Yes. Okay, uh, sadly, we've come to an end. It was a great discussion. So I'd really like to thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, uh, we'll definitely revisit this, uh, maybe in six months, uh, hold you to account for some of the things uh, you talked <laughs> about. Never. I would like to point out that um, we will be continuing with uh, the Power Open EHR sessions. Uh, the next one is uh, our new head of technology for UK and Ireland, Richard Kavanagh, who will have a technical deep dive with Ian McNichol, director of the Open EHR Foundation Board. Uh, and also, I need to remind you to scan the QR code on your screen, fill out a survey so we can improve these sessions uh, in the future. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.